Uh, yeah, we're going to watch this. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Thank you guys all for coming. My name is Cole Reese. I am the chief astronomer here at Battlepoint Astronomical Association. And uh, thank you all for coming out to our second member meeting. Uh, and today we're going to be doing a presentation on how to take your very first pictures of space. Um, so I know some of you guys here are experienced astrophotographers and some people here who have no experience. So uh, this course is uh, tonight is going to be on the more basic end of things. So uh, if you already know what you're doing, it's going to be more of a refresher. But uh, I think that there's definitely going to be some good stuff uh, to learn here for everyone. So uh, I'm going to go share my screen now. I think that's good. Okay. Because um, we don't need to see much of my face. Um, okay. All right. So it's there we go. Perfect. All right. So just for a little bit of a background, um, I uh, started astrophotography uh, in 2020 at the very beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, I fell in love with the hobby right away and I became very passionate about it. I went on road trips when we were all locked down and I went up to some national parks with uh, a 10 inch Dobsonian, which is very similar to this telescope here. It's just a little bit bigger. And I used my iPhone and I held it up to the eyepiece on here and I started taking photos of it, of things in space. And I completely fell in love with the hobby. Uh, I sunk thousands of dollars into it and thousands of hours. Um, and uh, these are some of the photos that I've taken. These are some of my favorite ones. Um, and uh, I do planetary, solar, lunar, and deep space photography. So I like all, all forms of it. Um, although they're all uh, objects in space, they're all very unique in how you go about capturing these photos. Uh, the equipment that you use and the techniques are all different. Um, so tonight's presentation is going to be covering the three basic steps you need to take your first photo. Uh, and it's going to also be a simple overview of each of these steps. And uh, mostly we're going to be discussing how to use the equipment that you already own. So if you have a DSLR or mirrorless camera like this, great, you're already ahead of the curve and you've got a wonderful piece of equipment. But most of us have our phones that we take pictures with. And this is still good enough, especially with uh, the technology that companies like Apple and Samsung, what they do with the software on that side of things is really amazing. So these can take really, really good photos of space. And so tonight's conversation is going to be about how we use our iPhones or Samsung or whatever phone you have to take pictures. And uh, we're going to be covering, uh, also we're going to be showing some examples and a, a simulated run through of these steps. Uh, tonight, we're not going to be covering in-depth processing techniques, calibration frames, exposure calculations, or any other technical jargon that you don't need yet uh, as a beginner. We're going to keep it simple. Um, so there's three basic steps when you're taking uh, to produce a photo of space. You're going to do acquisition, stacking, and processing. Uh, acquisition is going out at night and collecting photos with your camera uh, and just capturing photons as they come in. And then stacking is where we take all of those photos that we've taken. Sometimes it's uh, just a few photos. Sometimes it's hundreds. Sometimes it's even hundreds of thousands of photos. Um, for that photo that we had of Jupiter here, that was about 600,000 photos uh, combined to get that picture. Uh, and so in the stacking software, it combines all of those photos and it layers them on top of each other. And it does a lot of cool math to figure out which ones are the best. 
and it gives you a final photo that is significantly better than what a single photo might look like. And then we are going to do some processing that pulls out all the hidden details and so it's shareable to the internet, like Instagram, Facebook, whatever. So you're going to need a couple of things. And uh, luckily, most of you probably have almost everything on this list. Um, the best things for taking pictures are definitely going to be telescopes with astro, uh, dedicated astro cameras. Uh, there's no way around it that the equipment that's designed for this is going to work the best. Uh, but that's also expensive and uh, it's not useful for things outside of this. So it's understandable that not everyone wants to go out and spend the money. Uh, if you're really into photography, you might own a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. And these are excellent tools. Uh, they will work almost as good as an astro camera. And there are certain uh, things that you can use, such as these. Um, this is called a T adapter. And uh, we also have another one here that allows it to fit into smaller telescopes. And uh, actually, if you're to take a photo, if you're trying to take a photo with, let's say, a camera like this, you screw this on the front and it would slip into the eyepiece like that. Um, and these, this technique works. And if you spend even more money, you can get a telescope that will follow the sky and do uh, more stuff. But you don't need that when you're starting out. Your iPhone will do just good enough. Um, Preferably, you'll have a tripod. Uh, not everyone has one of those. So you can always, if you're outside, lean it up on a tree. Or um, if you're out on your back porch, you can lean it up on your railing or something like that. Uh, just anything where you're not touching your phone. Uh, you're also going to need clear, dark skies. Uh, no surprise that it's hard to take pictures of stars when it's cloudy or rainy. Uh, also, uh, preferably, uh, you have to be in a dark sky. So moonless nights are the best and also get away from the city. Here on Bainbridge is actually not too bad. Um, also optionally you have a tracking system, but we're not gonna be covering that. Uh, and lastly, you're going to need a lot of patience. This hobby is not for the faint hearted. It's going to take some time and it's gonna be frustrating, but I promise that it is totally worth it in the end. Um, so the acquisition step, which is the first thing you're going to do, um, it's going to be, uh, which I find could be the most fun is you go outside on, uh, you know, you know, it's going to be a good night. You see a clear sunset and you just go outside and you have your equipment with you. You get, you get ready, uh, preferably do it before sunset, especially on your first time, because trying to do it when it's really dark out can be a little frustrating. And then uh, if you're using your iPhone and you're trying to take pictures, uh, there's a couple of settings that you can turn on that are going to make it significantly better. Uh, recently, iPhones or Apple introduced a, what's called the night mode. Uh, and it might, you might see that turn on when it's kind of dark. Uh, it will turn on a mode that allows it to pick up more light. And if you have it completely still, it can go up to 30 seconds. You can adjust it in the settings. So when it's on a tripod or it's perched up against something, you can tell your phone to take up to 30 second pictures. Uh, and that works with a lot of the newer phones these days. Um, you also probably have a timer function in your camera settings. I recommend turning that on because when you hit capture, it's gonna bump your phone. And so that allows the vibrations to go away. And then, some phones also have the ability to shoot raw. Um, Frank and I were going over this the other day. Uh, for your iPhone, you have to go into the settings and uh, actually turn some of these features on. But most phones have these capabilities. So uh, long exposure, a timer, and a raw mode. All three of those will really improve your photos. And you're just going to go out there and take as many as you can. So let's say uh, you're pointing it, you point it due south and you just start taking photos. Uh, every 30 seconds, you're gonna go back and you're gonna take another photo and just keep doing this over and over. And every five to 10 minutes, you're gonna adjust your phone uh, if it's leaning up against something or a tripod to roughly 
follow the stars as they move. You don't have to do a perfect job of this because uh, that's when you're going to get into the computers and uh, it gets a lot more complex. But uh, you're going to want to do a little bit of adjustment maybe every 15 to 20 photos. Um, when you're out there, don't forget extra batteries, food, water, clothing, uh, because it's going to get cold, I bet. It's going to be dark. Uh, and your phone battery is probably going to want to die on you if you don't bring something to charge it. Um, once you're done with this, you're going to save all your photos to your computer, and uh, you can save it anywhere on your hard drive. And uh, then now you've completed the acquisition step. So you, at this point, you've taken, uh, it can be 10 photos, it could be 200 photos uh, of, of the night sky. And uh, and I'm not talking any specific constellation or anything. You're just, you point it due south and you just start taking pictures for an hour. Um, once you're done with this, you're going to save all of it to your computer. And then we're going to proceed on to the stacking step. So since it's cloudy, we're not going to do um, any of these in person. We're not going to do it directly, but I pre-recorded some videos uh, of when I did, uh, so I took some data from a uh, previous night that I took with my own telescope. And although it was taken with a telescope, it will still be applicable to what you're uh, doing with your iPhone. So you're going to pull up the folder with all your photos in them. Then you're going to drag them into whatever stacking software that you use. Um, there's a whole bunch out there. I recommend as a beginner to use Deep Sky Stacker because it's extremely easy. Uh, it's only available on Windows, though, so if you're on Mac, there's a bunch of options out there. I don't use Mac personally, so I don't know all of them. Uh, I'm sure we have members in our club who could point you in that direction. Uh, Mario is someone who uses Mac exclusively, so I'm sure he knows some really good software that you could use. Um, and then when you're in the software, you're going to tell it to register and stack frames and you're going to tell it to reject a small percentage. Don't worry, the software tells you to do this stuff, so it's easy. Ignore all the stuff about calibration. We're gonna push all past that, and then you're gonna save the final photo to your hard drive, and we'll be ready to process. So uh, here I have a video explaining exactly what this looks like. All right, so the first- Oh yeah, you gotta mute, my bad. Let me know when uh, All right, so the first thing you're going to do once you have saved the files to your hard drive and you've opened up Deep Sky Stacker or whichever stacking software you choose to use, you're going to then highlight all of your photos. As you can see here, mine are labeled 40 through 55. The extension here will depend on which type of uh, camera you're using, but all of them generally will work with this software. So FITS is part of uh, Astro cameras. Uh, it will all work the same though. So all you, you do is you highlight them and you drag them over and you let go. And it'll say, oh, you're adding these files and they are light frames because you're capturing light. And as you can see, it loads them all in here at the bottom. And then over here on the side, it says register checked pictures. So we're going to click that and we're not going to touch any of these settings and we are going to hit OK. And then it says, OK, blah, blah, blah. We're going to hit OK. Don't worry about what any of that says. And you're going to have it go through all of these settings. So it's going to do some math. And if you have 100 pictures or 200 pictures, you're going to drag all of those in. You're going to do them all at once. I'm just doing 16 for the sake of time. And then it's going to spit out a final image. And this is obviously not a uh, totally finished photo here, but it's got some data here. So this is what we call linear data. And so once we're here, we're not going to worry that there's not a lot of pretty picture. We're just going to go over here and click Save Picture to File. And we can name it uh, First stack and let's save it in our desktop easy peasy
All right, do we have any questions on Zoom? I don't see any All right. So that's the first two steps. So now you've gone out, you've taken your photos, you save them to your hard drive and you combine them all into one photo. And the next step is processing. And this is where it, everything kind of gets crazy. And you can, there's so many different options here where you can go with it. Um, and a lot of it is subjective. And this is where it goes away from a science and into an art. Um, because a, a lot of the, when you're taking these photos, if you want to use it for science, you're going to just take the raw linear data and you're going to send it off to organizations for them to look at because all they care about is levels of light on the camera. But what we want is to look at a really pretty picture. And so as soon as you start playing with the data and messing around with all the, um, the image itself, it now becomes uh, a piece of art and not a piece of science, but that's okay because that's what we're going for. Uh, so the first step in processing is to bring your stacked photo into your favorite photo editing software. Uh, PixInsight and Cyril, which are two pieces of software you've probably never heard of, um, are the best. They're kind of like Photoshop for astrophotography. Um, Photoshop and Lightroom, anything made by Adobe or a similar company is fantastic. It will also work. Um, although those are more for doing general photography and it can't do as much customization. Uh, but when you're getting started, uh, Adobe is a fantastic resource. For my the first year of my astrophotography, I was only editing things in Lightroom and a little bit in Photoshop. I didn't step up to uh, PixInsight until uh, about a year ago, and it's still very confusing. So, um, so once you've brought it into, let's say, uh, uh, Lightroom, which is what I'm gonna be showing you guys here in a bit, you're gonna play around with the exposure, the contrast, the saturation, <clears throat> and the goal is to bring up as much detail without completely cooking the data and, uh, uh, cooking the data looks exactly what it sounds like. It's if you were to deep fry something <clears throat> and it comes out and it's got all these ridiculous colors and it, it just looks oversaturated and um, a little too fantastical. Um, that is uh, what we call cooked data. And you don't necessarily want to do that. Um, this topic is ex very extensive and it can't be covered in one presentation. Uh, if we were to try to do a presentation on this, it would be a series of presentations. Uh, but if you want to know more, YouTube is your friend. There are lots of tutorials available. Uh, there's a lot of great YouTubers out there and people on Cloudy Nights and the Pix Insight forums or um, all these uh, websites that where people are discussing this stuff regularly. So the information's out there, um, but to quickly cover uh, exactly how we're gonna process data, uh, I'm gonna show a quick tutorial from here in Lightroom. So Frank, would you swap us over? All right, so here we are. We've got our photo in Lightroom. We just dragged it in here, very easy, imported it. You can use any sort of photo editing software that you like. It just has to have all of these tone controls over here. And we're just gonna start playing around with these. So the first thing to do is bump up the exposure. Um, and that's going to reveal some of the, the detail. You can see when we, we don't want to blow it out too much, but we want to start bringing these colors right up to about, I don't know, here maybe. And already we can start seeing some detail. And then we're going to play around with these contrast sliders here. That's going to, we don't want too much contrast because we're going to be able to play around with the rest of these sliders here. Uh, and uh, the highlights is just going to mess with the stars a little bit, bringing out a little extra detail. Um, and also our, our whites, we don't want them to crush it too hard. 
And then our blacks here is really what's going to start pulling out the detail. And so now we have now done what's called a manual auto stretch or just a, a stretch of your data, a manual stretch of your data. And so we're just going to keep playing around with these sliders here. And uh, there's no right or wrong method here. Um, it's all about just uh, slight tweaks and playing around with it to see if you can get it to look a little better here and there. Well, that's starting to look really nice. All right. And uh, see if we can... We don't want to crush the blacks, but we don't want to have them be too apparent. That's looking really nice. See if we can adjust the shadows a bit here. Oh, well, there we go. I'm liking that. And uh, we don't want too much contrast, but it does help the image look a little bit better. So that's already looking really, really nice. And there's also things that we have like texture and clarity. We don't want to mess with those too much. Um, but as you can see, uh, it, it does add a little more definition to these stars here. But if you were to zoom in on the data, look what happens is it goes from, you know, it's got a nice soft blur to it and it, everything just kind of has a bit of, it's almost a little too sharp. And same with things like clarity. You know, you can bump these sliders up, but you don't want to go too crazy with it. The dehaze is not the one that you're going to want to mess with, but texture and clarity, they can do a little bit of uh, work for you to start pulling out some nice uh, data here. So that's how easy it was to go from a uh, something that was almost nothing to something like this. So you can see that's how much of a difference we can get by just playing around with the sliders here. And so once you've got a final photo that you like, you can go up here to the top and click File, Export, and you can have it do whatever you want. I'm just going to have it saved to the desktop hard drive. And uh, we don't need to do any of this crazy stuff. Just hit Export. And now it, it should be saved on my desktop. So. So you can see here is the saved photo, just like it looked in Lightroom. So there we go. From what appeared to be almost a black photo and just playing around with the data and because most of this, where these stars are, existed in that area that was almost black, but not fully black. And so we stretched those, that data across to be in the midtones of our histogram. And that's what brought out all this detail. So we were able to go from almost nothing to a pretty great photo. Um, and like I said, this was captured with my own telescope. Uh, so this is with some of that higher end equipment, but the process works the exact same for when you're using something like your iPhone to take these photos. And so uh, now on to specifically some of the stuff we're going to be doing with your iPhone, uh, because it's better than you think. And if you master these techniques on your phone, um, you can still get really good photos and it applies directly to the bigger telescopes. The tel that we have upstairs on the roof, the 27 and a half inch mirror works the exact same as the camera on your phone. It's just way bigger. Um, and so uh, another reason why you're gonna wanna use your phone is because good astro equipment is very expensive and you already own your iPhone. Also, uh, in the meantime, we do offer loaner scopes. So if you do fall in love with using uh, or taking photos of space, um, it's not too hard to hook it up to um, one of these telescopes in a process called eyepiece projection, which is uh, this telescope here, for example. And uh, this is just a quick demonstration. 
So this telescope has an eyepiece on it where you normally look through at, uh, at an object and eyepiece projection is literally holding your phone up to it and taking a picture. And um, we're gonna actually look at a couple photos that involve eyepiece projection and show you how cool some of the results you can get out of it are. So if you're uh, starting out with wide field photography, uh, that's just taking your phone and pointing it up at the stars and taking a picture. This is what you could possibly expect from your phone just by doing the long exposure and the uh, timer and the raw and just playing around with a little bit of it in Photoshop or Lightroom. You can get a photo that looks this good out of it. This was taken uh, by one of my friends down in South Carolina. Uh, he is using a Samsung S22 Ultra, and it's a single picture uh, at 20 seconds. And his phone allows him to do a little bit of the control here. So it's at ISO 400, and he just propped it up on uh, on a railing or on a, on a on a piece of wood or something like that. So. He was able to just take this photo when he was outside working uh, on his telescope. And uh, you can see Orion here in the photo. Uh, Orion's belt goes across here, the, these three stars here, and uh, M42 and M43 are right here. So he got a pretty good photo. You get out some darker skies and you can get stuff like this. This was taken with an iPhone camera, probably uh, an iPhone 12. Um, I don't know if it was a pro or not, but uh, this was taken in Boral 2 skies at uh, an observatory in Croatia. This is uh, another one of my friends um, and he operates this observatory through his university. Um, I have a lot of international friends through this hobby. It's very cool. Uh, the people that you get to meet. But this is just a single sub that he took with his uh, phone. And uh, there's actually a pretty good chance that this is even handheld, uh, that he just held it up and clicked. Because you can see there's a little bit of smearing in the photo and it's, it's dragged around a bit. But you're able to still get a great, great photo out of your iPhone when you're out in the dark sky. So if you're ever camping in the middle of nowhere, Use some of the techniques that we taught you here, and you'll be able to get photos like this. Here's another one that he took out at his observatory, and uh, this is a single sub. This is a 30 second exposure taken from an iPhone. And you can see when you have these dark skies like this, the Milky Way can really pop out and show some serious detail where it's, just, I think, it looks spectacular. And this is just with an iPhone, which is just. So crazy. Uh, and then here's an example directly of how stacking can improve your photo. So this is from one of my friends uh, and he took this photo from his backyard. So it's probably Bortle six would be my guess, five or six. And this is just with his iPhone. And this photo has actually been cropped down. So originally it was a larger photo than this, but um, he took, um, this is with a Samsung S10, so it's a, an older phone as well, um, probably 2018, 2019, uh, not really old, but not brand new. And he took 30 photos, and then he stacked them, and he just played around a little bit with uh, some of the software um, that we were using, like Lightroom, and he was able to pull out all this detail. So before, previously, you can see um, here's Orion's belt and here's M42, but you don't get any of the detail around it versus in this photo, you can clearly see Barnard's loop, which I'm amazed that he was able to capture that with his iPhone. And you're also getting all the, these dust lanes here in the Milky Way. I, I was very impressed that he was able to get this out uh, of something with just a phone. And uh, this is actually one of the photos that I was like, wow, I want to do a presentation on this because you're able to do this with something you already own. That's amazing. So uh, that's what stacking can do. Um, and then also he used a little bit of masking here. Um, these clouds at the bottom, 
uh, were having issues when he was trying to mess with the data up here. He wanted to pull detail out of this, but he didn't want to include the cloud. So he used what's called masking, a technique that says, okay, we're only going to adjust a certain portion of the picture. And uh, it allows you to define those portions of the photo and it creates a mask. And so that was a technique that he used to help get all that detail at the top while not blowing out the cloud. Um, and then when you step into eyepiece projection, this is where you can get some really crazy stuff. So this photo was taken by the same guy who works at this observatory. Um, and so this is with a Newtonian reflector telescope, similar to the one that we have upstairs, um, but also right, right here. This would be like taking this telescope and having it point at something and then just sitting there every 30 seconds and clicking, take a new photo every 30 seconds. So he did this for one hour, roughly, and then he combined the best photos and he stacked them in Deep Sky Stacker and then he brought it into a software like Photoshop or Lightroom and just played around with those sliders and adjusted the colors and the, the values of everything. And this is the picture that he was able to get. Granted, this guy is in college for astrophysics and he works at an observatory. So he's going to be really good at this stuff, but that's the picture that he was able to get over Orion. And what this photo right here, this this big spot here and this spot right here is that dot and that dot and that's with an iphone so what you have in your pocket is completely capable of taking a good photo is it cap cap capable of taking the best photos that you've ever seen no but it's dang good i think that is a very very impressive photo uh and to know that that came out of an iPhone is just crazy to me. Um, you can also do things like lunar photography. Um, this is also done with eyepiece projection. So again, he had his iPhone probably use, using a little mount uh, that clamps to the eyepiece. Uh, those are about $50 if you want to get one. Um, and when you're starting out, I highly recommend it. Uh, that's exactly what got me hooked on the hobby. And this is just a single photo, um, no stacking or anything like that. And you just clicked, and this is the photo you got of the moon. And you can see uh, there's a lot of craters here. There's not a whole lot of detail on the outside here, but where it is in focus is nice and sharp. Uh, but very little processing was done on this photo at all. You can also do planetary. <laughs> These are also iPhone photos done with ip projection and this is no editing no processing this is literally snap here you go here's the photo i got and you can clearly tell that that's saturn and jupiter which is really really impressive and no editing you didn't even bring it into that stacking software or the photoshop that we were using this is just straight out of the camera and the, again, this is with eyepiece projection. So not just holding your phone up, but using it with a, in combination with a telescope. Um, so a final note, astrophotography is hard. Do not get discouraged if your first photos don't come out looking great. My first photos were horrible. Over time, you will get better and your skills will improve. Start with your phone, then borrow one of our telescopes and you can start getting the hang of it. Ask questions, get comfortable with making mistakes and have fun. Enjoy the time you, uh, you spend outside as I have found that the journey is just as exciting as the destination. Uh, and thank you to all my friends who let me borrow their images to make this presentation. And finally, uh, one photo from my friend who lives down in Australia, who is uh, a PhD uh, student right now working at observatories across the world. This is a, photo that he captured last week so all right we have one question on zoom let's hear it uh let wants to know let's see uh if he wants to know is lightroom part of the deep sky stack 
No. So Lightroom is a piece of software that I did pay for, uh, and I pay for it every month. And it is not the best choice for everyone. If you're doing lots of photography and uh, creative work, then it might make sense to have something like Lightroom. But there's also three options. Uh, Adobe. Adobe, yes. So I pay, and it's about $60 a month, which is expensive. And most people, they don't need it. Uh, I'm doing stuff like this every single day, so it makes sense. Um, but for someone who just wants to do this one time, there are three pieces of software uh, out there that are really good. Um, GIMP is one that I can recommend, G-I-M-P. Uh, and it is very similar to Photoshop, it's free. Uh, and there, there's other uh, software similar to GIMP and uh, Photoshop that will work that are totally free for you to use. Um, also Cyril, S-I-R-I-L, is compatible with all operating systems. And it is a free version of PixInsight, which is the software that I use now to edit all my photos. And it's really, really good. They're working on it all the time. And uh, although I don't use it myself, I have a lot of friends that use it and they highly recommend it. But it is complicated. So um, I recommend starting out with something free like GIMP or, um, although it's not free, uh, Lightroom or Photoshop. Yeah. Hey, this, this last image here, uh, how is that? That's a great question. So this would be a comment. Well, actually, when he took this, he's up on a mountain. He's actually above the clouds, you can see here. So the conditions are so good here that I wouldn't be surprised if this is the raw data coming out of his camera. And so um, how I would do this is I would bring it into a piece of software like uh, PixInsight. And there's a, a function called Blink, which just allows you to play all your photos back in a quick slideshow. And then I would record that slideshow. But for this, he could bring it into um, a whole combination of uh, video editing softwares and tell it, hey, take each one of these photos, make it one frame long, play them all in a row. And so that's uh, exactly what he would have done to get this photo. And there might be a little bit of editing going on just to bring out the stars, but nothing more than uh, just a, a simple stretch of the data. Is he filming a meteor shower or those airplanes? Um, you got airplanes, a lot of airplanes uh, that you can see here. Um, I'm sure some of them are satellites, um, but a lot of them are airplanes. Yeah, some of the ones you see here in the corners, like there's, yeah, the ones that were shooting over here. Yeah. That one and that one, those are definitely satellites. But really cool. Also, we don't know which observatory this is, in case you were wondering. We were, we were supposed to figure that out, but I didn't think we were doing that. But uh, really cool. Also, this is Vega. So that's viewable uh, in the sky right now uh, from where we're at. So any more questions? Yeah, do you ever do videos or it's just single photographs? Oh, yeah. So um, that's a good question. So when this, this here was taken, these were individual photos. This was not a video, but what you would do is you open up a video editing software and you take each one of those individual photos and you'd bring it in and it will then treat all those photos it'll combine them as if they're frames of a video basically a time lapse exactly yeah you're creating your own time lapse and he might even have a, a feature that's built into his camera that can you know automatically create a time lapse with the, the pictures but my guess is that these are uh 15 or 10 seconds sub uh, at, you know, four to 800 ISO, he gets these good uh, pictures. You can see, you know, when you're looking at the dome here, if you're to come up close, you can actually see some of the noise in the photo where it's kind of grainy. Uh, so that there, there's little hints in there that show you a little bit of information about it. Like you, you can tell that also, since the stars are moving, that means it was an untracked photo. You just, you know, had it on a tripod. 
So uh, you don't, to get a great photo like this, all he did was take his equipment out to a dark site. You know, he, he didn't go out and buy a $2,000 tracking system and all that crazy stuff. He just took a nice camera that he had and went out to a, a place where he could see the stars. Is this an iPhone also? No. Uh, this was probably a very similar camera to this. Yeah, so they, if you want to get crazy good photos like this, um, you're probably going to want something a little higher end. But um, even then, like you can get a camera that's, you know, 600 bucks to 1,000 bucks, and it will do a really, really great job. Um, and some of the Astro cameras that they make, um, if you um, are, well, some of them are really expensive because the bigger the sensor, the more it's going to cost. But you can get uh, Astro cameras for a few hundred dollars that are really, really good and can take excellent photos of the planets. And um, even with like a simple telescope like this, they they just um, will have a, an adapter like that real quick. So you'll have a, it's a basic camera body that's about the size of a hockey puck. And it's got a USB cable on it, and it's slots onto the front of this, and it just goes in an IP folder like that. And now you're using one of those Astro cameras that connects to your laptop, and so it takes away the all the steps of you know having to go out there and click a button on your phone or something like that. There's software that you'll have on your laptop that is then taking the pictures for you, and it'll do everything automatically. But that's also getting into a, a little bit more complex stuff. And I wanted to keep this uh, on the more basic side so it would be accessible to everyone. But that is the next step is, is getting a, a camera that can uh, dedicate and go into something like this and work with uh, a computer or a laptop. That's, and that's what I highly recommend. Uh, although a camera like this is great, uh, there are some limitations to it that uh, the Astro cameras don't have at all. Uh, things like if you want to take longer than 30 second exposures on here, you have to do some, uh, some fun stuff. Or if you want to do specific sequences, you have to dial everything in versus uh, the software on your laptop is just click a few buttons and it is designed to do it. So. You, you know, you can spend 30 bucks and buy an intervalometer and hook it up to your- Yeah. Thing and shoot a thousand pictures yeah. automatically. I mean, I sometimes set mine up and go to sleep. Yep. Yeah. You do know? you have a do you have any battery issues when you do that, or do you have uh, like a dedicated power supply for you? I really don't. I don't have battery issues because okay. um, you know I turn those functions off that don't need to be on, and the mirrors up once, so there's no you know. It's not taking the energy to move the mirror. Mm -hmm. um, so no, I can shoot, I don't know, probably a thousand frames, but I do have a battery pack and a dummy battery mm -hmm. so that if I wanted, I could take, okay. I don't know, 4,000 pictures, <laughs> you know? Yep. And it, I mean, that's a good way to do it. Yeah, I, I highly recommend. And um, yeah, don't be discouraged. If you have a camera like this, by all means, go out and shoot with it. It is going to give you great, great, great results. But if you just want to go out, if you don't have a camera and you just want to take pictures of space, um, this would probably be more expensive than going out and getting an Astro camera because you're going to have to buy lenses for this thing and all that stuff where um, a simple Astro camera can be hooked up to one of our telescopes and work right away. I think a lot of it depends what you want to shoot. Exactly. That's if a huge, you wanted, huge I mean, thing. One way to start out is doing the Milky Way, which is really cool. And if you have a mirrorless or an SLR, DSLR, you can get some great pictures. Mm -hmm. You can do star trails, which mm -hmm. is kind of a different way of processing the same mm -hmm. data that produces video. Mm -hmm. That'd be one where it shows all the lines of the stars we did throughout the night. Um, and that's mostly what today's presentation was about, is just going out and taking pictures of uh, the Milky Way, because that's how I got started, and that's how I fell in love with it. And my first pictures were of the Milky Way, 
uh, and of Jupiter, Saturn, and Comet Neowise, which I don't know if any of you guys remember that one that was uh, right at the beginning of uh, was it probably May or June 2020 was when that one came around. And I was in uh, Death Valley. And it was just spectacular. I was out there with my uh, Dobsonian, and uh, I'll never forget it. it. It was just amazing. It was one of the coolest experiences ever. I got hooked. That was that was probably what got me into astrophotography for, for life. But um, go out and shoot the Milky Way. It's it's the best way to get started in this hobby, and it allows you to uh, enjoy uh, night. I, I, I enjoy getting out there and enjoying the night sky. It's very peaceful. And this is a good way to enjoy it and to get something out of it. So, so one, one place to shoot is, is to go to the Olympic National Park uh, and go up to Hurricane Ridge. And if you do that during what they call Milky Way season, which is a little bit of a misnomer because you can always, <laughs> the Milky Way is always out there. But what you can always see is the galactic center or the galactic core. So that's around here, you could see it from like April through September. And if you go up uh, to Hurricane Ridge, around the time of the new moon, they, they have a star program up there where there'll be a guy up there, or several people with multiple telescopes. And you can visualize some stuff and you can shoot there. You can shoot the Milky Way or Star Trails. It's really, you know, pretty dark. Although there's light pollution, but pretty dark and a fun place to shoot because there are going to be other people shooting. Yeah. It, definitely go up to Hurricane Ridge for a star party if you ever get the chance. It, it's unforgettable. Um, do we have any more questions on Zoom? Yeah, we got uh, another one here. Um, uh, deep sky stacker is the input image for the input image for processing software. What's the deep sky stacker? Um, is the input image? Wait, sorry. Would you repeat it one more one more time? It says a simple deep sky stacker is the input image for processing software. Um. Oh, so. Len, did you mean? Uh, is that the? Is it the image input for processing software? So, okay, so let me, what I think he's saying, or oh, let me try to break it down exactly. So I think what we do is we, we take, you know, let's say you took a dozen photos and then those all, you, you'd select, um, you highlight all of those files and you bring them into Deep Sky Stacker and then it will combine all of those. And then when you click save, and you save it to somewhere on your computer, it will just, you, you know, you can save it to your desktop. And then you'll now have a, a picture on your desktop that looks black. And that gives you your, your next photo. And then once you have that black photo, let's say you saved it to your, your desktop, then you're going to take your next piece of software, like your uh, Photoshop, and you're just going to take that file and you're going to drag it into that, allowing you to import it into that. I think that's what he was asking about. Did we get that right, Len? I got you on a speaker now, so go ahead and talk. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Great. Any other questions from Zoom? I'm not seeing anything. Go raise hands. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Great. Will your presentation be available in hard copy? Ooh, um, that's a good question. So we're recording this. Is that what you mean, Mike? Well, I either yeah, yeah. or. So we're recording this, but this is the first time we've done this format where the speaker's here in the room and we've got people on Zoom. So yeah. I, I can't yet guarantee the quality of the recording is good, but we'll see what it is and we can share yeah. it to make sure it's good. Yeah. If anyone is interested in shooting the Milky Way, there's a, a woman who she gives classes, class, master classes in uh, shooting the Milky Way, but she also does a series of three classes that are free. Mm -hmm. She's a good teacher, and she'll she'll do it like twice a year as it that's a way that she uh, recruits for her master class. So she does these three hour and a half type classes goes through everything, uh, 
I've listened to it a couple of times and she, she's a good teacher. So I'm trying to remember her name. I'll, I'll, I'll get it to Cole if anyone's interested and you can contact Cole. Yeah, <laughs> definitely would love to get that out to everyone. Because yeah, as many resources as you can have for this. Um, my presentation here is just one of many resources that you should uh, tap into when you're getting into this hobby. Um, and uh, we are here to answer questions for you. If you have any questions, um, we're happy to answer as many of them. But Google can also answer a lot. And it's crazy how much of this stuff I've learned just from searching it on Google. Um, and digging through old forum posts that are like 10, 12 years old. Um, the information's all available, so. I was just looking it up too, and it looks like there's a Udemy um, beginner class on national photography for the Milky Way and stuff. So oh, really? That might be another resource for you. What was the resource again? Yeah, uh, Udemy. Udemy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, they, they offer like a lot of online classes about a variety of topics, but it looks like they have an astrophotography of the Milky Way. Oh, that's awesome. I'll definitely have to check that one out. So, yeah, well, so who here has never taken a photo of space before? All right, so do you guys think with uh, what you've learned tonight, you'd be able to go out and try to take a photo? Awesome. Well, um, if you do run into any issues uh, or questions that you have along the way, please uh, get in contact with us right away and uh, we'd be happy to help you out. Uh, but welcome to the hobby of astrophotography. <laughs> it's a lot of fun and uh, you're gonna get sucked into it very quickly. But thanks. Yeah, thank you. of course. <laughs> Uh, let me ask real quick, show of hands, how many of you are members of the BBAA? Right? I, so. I just joined like two days ago. Two days ago. Okay. Perfect. Great. What's your name? Frank. Frank. Welcome. I'm Frank. Too. Hey, Frank. <laughs> All right. That's great. Sweet. And we have telescopes for long. So uh, you probably want to come check those out sometime. Whether you think it's better. And uh, try your hand out. Is there a list of telescopes? Is it just the two or is it? Oh, no, we have all of them. Oh, there's actually like several astrophotography classes on them, including some um, oh, wow. processing. Oh, wow. Oh, that's, oh, wow. That's awesome. <laughs> that's great. I'm going to have to check that out because there's not enough resources on the Pixel site. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's either. <laughs> <laughs> What's, what's next? It's $5 for storage here. What's the, well, yeah, you guys, would you guys be interested in another part to this series? Yeah. Yeah, I would be happy to. Do you own a tracker? Yeah, not, but that's not really the kind of project we do with that. Um, yeah, so uh, I do own I have my telescope's up on the roof right now. I have. Um, what would be equivalent to an EQ6 R Pro right. um, mount. And I have a Celestron Edge HD with an eight inch uh, short right. pass screen. Right. And I use a micro four thirds uh, camera. Okay. So and, and it's a dedicated bathroom. Oh, okay. um, and I've been using it for about a year and a half now. And it's a great setup. I absolutely love it. It was expensive, but definitely worth the investment. Um, and that is where the these tutorials in this I would love to scale this up to that point where we're talking about uh, using big equipment and how to polar align and how to do like it, like exposure calculations and flat field corrections and stuff like that. It's going to get crazy, uh, but I would love to if you guys are interested, I'm definitely interested.